I spent a lot of time in the Auburn High School Auditorium. It was, I believe, the most affordable stage to rent in town, and therefore the go-to location for recitals. The Community College's Performing Arts Center was reserved for the big leagues. The Nutcracker and the annual Junior Miss pageant, both of which I participated in. Although I do want to note that by the time I competed, Junior Miss had been renamed the Distinguished Young Women of America Scholarship Competition, but that is a story for another time. <laughs> My dance recitals took place in the Auburn High Auditorium for at least a decade, so I was a regular. And I knew the backstage like the back of my hand. And when I cast my mind back to that time, there's this one element that looms large in my mind of the backstage area. The spiral staircases. The spiral staircases stood in their rusty metal glory, one in each wing, curving up to teeny tiny little dressing rooms. And these dressing rooms, they were wildly impractical. They couldn't fit more than five people, maybe. And their location meant that basically any conversation or noise from those dressing rooms could be heard on stage. Yet, they were hallowed ground because they could only be used by the older girls. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of the older girls. This might be a phenomenon unique to suburban dance studios. But the older girls are, well, they're the older girls. <laughs> they're in high school, and they get to wear the pancake tutus, the flat ones, and they can do pirouettes on point. And it was a sign of ascension within the studio to become an older girl and to be allowed to climb up those rickety, impractical stairs and use those dressing rooms instead of the choir room down the hall. I'm surprised there weren't more sprained ankles and quite frankly broken bones because climbing up and down those stairs in your dance shoes was really quite tricky. These stairs were a link between realms between the mundane of childhood and the mysteries of adolescence. Today's New Testament text is a similar sort of stairway, transporting us between realms. It helps us get from the heightened poetic beginning of John's Gospel, which begins... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. To the flesh and blood ministry of Jesus. It helps to link the one who was with God at the beginning of creation with the vulnerable baby in the manger with the man whose ministry we will follow through the gospel and ultimately to the cross. That's quite the task, <laughs> for even with this textual stairway, it can be hard to wrap our minds fully around all that is Jesus. Jesus, who in this one single passage is referred to by multiple names. He is rabbi, 
son of God, king of Israel, son of man, son of Joseph from Nazareth, the one of whom Moses and the prophets spoke. So one of the very first things this passage teaches us is that Jesus is unexpected. It's unexpected for one person to hold all of these identities. And it's unexpected for that one person to come from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? We meet two disciples in this passage. The first is Philip. Philip is a disciple who was recently recruited from Galilee. Philip, in turn, shares the news of Jesus of Nazareth with a man named Nathaniel. Philip tells Nathaniel that Jesus is the one they've been waiting for, and he invites Nathaniel to get involved with this movement. Nathaniel responds with a question. Can anything good come from Nazareth? And the king of Israel isn't supposed to come from Nazareth, a small town of about 500 people. Great leaders and royalty come from cities like Jerusalem, places with wealth and privilege and some level of renown. I'll refrain from drawing too direct a parallel. But we know these sorts of places, right? We know the places that are talked about in a similar way in our day and age. We know the neighborhoods, the small towns, the school districts, the countries and lands from which it is said nothing good come. Yet, Jesus does indeed come from Nazareth. And Philip invites Nathanael to come and see for himself, to come and draw his own conclusions about Jesus. Jesus is from an unexpected place. He has these unexpected identities, and his greeting to Nathanael is similarly unexpected. He greets Nathanael as if he already knows him. And Nathanael is confused by this, so he asks, where did you get to know me? Jesus explains that he saw Nathanael under the fig tree. That's a location that was often used for rest, but also for study and discussion of scripture. Nathanael is flabbergasted and immediately proclaims that Jesus must indeed be the Son of God. This interaction, I'll admit, can be a little confusing. <laughs> After all, what's so special about seeing someone under a fig tree? But let's try to put ourselves in Nathaniel's shoes for a moment. Imagine that we lived in a world without social media. Oh, that sounds nice. <laughs> Imagine that there was no Facebook or Google or LinkedIn, no platform that contained your personal information. And imagine meeting someone for the first time who already knows your name. Not only do they know your name, they know where you hang out and who you hang out with, how you spend your time. They even know something about the quality of your character. That would be alarming, I think, to me. <laughs> but imagine that this recognition came with no sense of threat or danger. But despite all odds, it came with a sense of warmth. A warmth of being truly seen by this stranger. It might still be alarming at least a little bit, but it also might feel like a miracle. 
That's how it felt for Nathaniel. It felt like enough of a miracle that he is immediately ready to proclaim Jesus the Son of God. That's the second thing this passage teaches us about Jesus. Jesus sees us. Jesus knows us. Recall the words of Psalm 139 that we heard earlier in our service. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. Being known in this way can feel alarming. It's vulnerable. It's hard to be fully seen, seen with all of our accomplishments and wonders, but also with all of our faults and our failures, the things that we'd rather keep hidden. But it is such a miracle. It is a miracle to be intimately known by the creator of the universe. That's what I was thinking as I drove down this morning, the God who created something like this beautiful lake. And the way the sun is hitting it, that creator knows me. We are intimately known and intimately loved. Jesus shocks Nathaniel with this knowledge. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus essentially says to Nathaniel, you think me knowing your name is cool? Oh, just you wait. And here, Jesus' language pivots from second-person singular to second-person plural as he begins to address an audience that's wider than just Nathaniel. So allow me to paraphrase this next part using my personal favorite second-person plural pronoun, y'all. Jesus says, y'all will see greater things than these. I promise y'all will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus is making a reference here. He's referencing the story of Jacob's ladder from the book of Genesis. A quick recap for all of us. Jacob was one of Abraham's grandsons. But he was a complicated man. You might remember he conspired with his mother to trick his father into giving him his twin brother's inheritance. Jacob didn't always do the right thing, which makes him just like the rest of us. Anyways, there's a story in Genesis about a dream that Jacob has while he's on a journey to find his wife. I'm reading here from Genesis 28, starting at verse 12. And Jacob dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And then Jacob was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this the gate of heaven. Jacob dreams of this ladder. It's actually the, the translation in the original language. It's really more of a stairway or a ramp that connects heaven and earth. And this dream tells Jacob that 
God isn't some far away, unreachable, untouchable, unaccessible God. This dream tells him that God wants to connect with humans. And that God promises to keep Jacob wherever he goes. This stairway is a link between realms, between heaven and earth. And again, it comes at an unexpected place. Do you hear the similarities? A God who knows Jacob, a God who promises to be with Jacob, a God who shows up in an unexpected place. Jesus is a Messiah who knows Nathaniel, who makes a promise to Nathaniel, who shows up in an unexpected place. Jesus references this passage for a reason. But there's a twist, because in the Gospel of John, it isn't just a place that's a stairway to God. It's a person. It's Jesus himself. Jesus is a stairway, a ladder, a link between heaven and earth. Jesus himself is a promise that God is with us even when we don't know it and even when we don't expect it. This is the Jesus who calls Philip and Nathaniel to be his disciples. And this is the Jesus who calls us to the same. Discipleship. We hear that word often. It's an important concept for the Christian faith, discipleship. But I think it's one that can sometimes feel distant. We don't get a face-to-face -face interaction with Jesus. We aren't fishermen being called to leave behind our nets and follow. So what can this text teach us about discipleship here and now in the year 2024? Discipleship asks us to look for this connection between heaven and earth. Even on a fairly quiet morning like this, we live in a profoundly noisy world. I looked this up. The average smartphone user gets at least 46 notifications a day. And I read that, and that honestly sounded low to me. Trebi says something about how much I'm on my phone. I think I get more than 46. We're constantly being notified by emails, texts, phone calls, news alerts, to say nothing of just the pace of our lives and the literal sounds of our environment, especially living in a city. The connection between heaven and earth doesn't have an alert. It doesn't have a push notification. It doesn't ping your Apple Watch or show up in your inbox most of the time. Maybe I shouldn't discount it, but most of the time. Yet these connections, they exist all around us, often in unexpected places. The connection between heaven and earth is the taste of communion on a Sunday morning. The connection between heaven and earth is the genuine smile you share with someone on the bus. It's the pit in your stomach when you see those without housing on a frigid winter morning. It's the hand you hold as you fall asleep, or the memory of the hand that you held. Discipleship asks us to see these stairways, and then it asks us to climb them, to participate in the connection to the divine. Discipleship is active. It's an identity, but it's also a behavior. Discipleship takes our attention and our time and our effort. And these efforts can take a number of forms. Here's just a few examples. You could volunteer in the neighborhood. You could get involved in a church ministry. Seriously. 
The work of the church, it belongs to all of us. You could cultivate a regular prayer practice. You could carry around some spare gloves and hats that you can give to someone who needs them. You could cook a meal for that person in your life who you know is going through it. In the noise of our world, I think we sometimes feel like our actions are pointless. We can't possibly, as one person or even one congregation, solve climate change, mass incarceration, and the lack of housing, so why should we try? But that sort of apathy, it's antithetical to discipleship. Discipleship says, try. (laughs) Try, because it matters. And as we try, discipleship changes our perspective. Moving up and down a staircase, it changes your perspective, right? We see things differently when we're just one or two steps up or one or two steps down. I think here of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's his holiday tomorrow. A holiday that many will spend without thinking of the why. And the why, why we celebrate his work, it's as necessary and relevant today as it was over 50 years ago. Dr. King was a disciple of Jesus. And he certainly climbed the stairway. He famously climbed it all the way to the mountaintop, right? And he saw things differently there. He saw how heaven and earth connect, and he invited people to be involved. For finally, discipleship involves invitation. Like Philip or like Martin, to invite others to come and see, to come and be known. That might be telling a friend that you're praying for them. Sharing a meaningful moment that you had, it's inviting someone to church, it's advocating for change, it's inviting this new world into being little piece by little piece at a time. And in this way, we too become like a staircase. We too become a link as we reach out a hand for someone else. We become this beautiful chain of disciples, linking hands even in the face of the dark and the unknown. Amen.